The Nuts and Bolts of Writing, Season Two, a podcast where we talk about literature, the ins and outs of writing, and how to actually start writing. Hi, everyone. Today it's just me, Fortunus Games, the host of this podcast. Today we'll be talking about a topic I've been thinking about since last September, in September 2022, when I first met Tete de Punk in real life for the first time, and we realized something while at the Toronto Zoo. It was a gray, dreary day, and the animals looked very unhappy. And there were some strange people at the zoo, and we were going to talk about our characters when we realized we didn't want to. Instead, there were so many things happening in front of us in our real lives that our previous internet obsession with characters seemed to pale in comparison. So this has prompted me to make a podcast about the differences between writing a story or graphic novel or or filming a movie or any other kind of you know creation you're making and creating quote unquote original characters or OCs in deviant art parlance. So Tete, welcome to this podcast. It's awesome to be on here. I'm happy to be back again. It's been a long, well, it's been a while, not too long, but it's good to be back on home turf. Yes. So the first question is, what do you think is the difference between writing a novel, filming a movie, or creating a graphic novel versus just quote unquote creating original characters? This is a very, very excellent question. And this is also a very uh, timely question because uh, a couple of days ago on Sunday, I was enjoying the Academy Awards, which I hadn't seen in seven years because nothing of note or interest had happened uh, in those seven years that would make me want to watch it. But as I was watching the Academy Awards and I was thinking about the elements of movie making and how that turns into that art medium that we call film, it made me think about the structure, but also what connects with the audience? Why do audiences like these? Why, you know, why is something so popular? Why is something so significant? And the main difference between writing a novel or creating a graphic novel or even creating a film is that there is a lot of thought and consideration that goes into it. Not only do you have to consider when you first start out on it, you want to think about not only the characters, but what theme or message they're conveying. If you're just doing original characters versus that, if you will, <laughs> um, you're just thinking about, oh, cool character. Or, oh, badass design. You know, suddenly it's 2007 and you're enjoying Shonen again. That said, why did we enjoy Shonen as, as young kids? It's because there was a theme. It was because... There was the power of friendship. There was, I'm going to save, you know, Sasuke. I'm going to bring him <laughs> back to the village. Or I'm going to save Rukia from her execution. Or, you know, whatever have you. Um, you know, that shows our age. I, I guess these youngsters don't know, uh, you know, the, 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 shonen, the, the shonen stuff we're talking about. Um, but, you know, but then also, too, I was thinking about movies and I was thinking, too, uh, I was thinking of one of my favorite directors, Steven Spielberg, and why his movies are usually solid. And it's it's because there's always a theme. There's always a theme that the characters convey. Like, you know, there's something very direct and arresting about the characters. But the biggest theme is is uh, the biggest thing is, is the theme that he's able to uh, convey uh, in in the plot of the movie itself. But when you're just doing original characters, like I said, you're just thinking of badass design, cool abilities, or you're just thinking about them endlessly going on adventures. And while you may bring something up like maybe a theme, the problem is you're so lost in the badassery of it all that you never get the theme across really well. And then on top of that, it is an echo chamber because the OC, is it for you, for your entire consumption, or is it a story you're willing to share with an audience and connect with an audience and say, this is what this story is about, and this is what this character is going through. But I want to show you how this character overcomes something. And, and usually the main 
crises or the main goal, if you will, of any good story is a figure or figures overcoming a challenge. And that challenge can be anything. The only problem is when you do an OC, you never know what the structure is. You never know what the end goal is. And on top of that, there is sort of a lack of consideration for the audience. So you may spend hours designing and perfecting your character or, you know, speculating all these scenarios in your head. And you're like, wow, they're so vibrant, but they're only living in your head. The audience just sees a cool picture and some really uh, elegant paragraphs, but it's, I don't know, it's a bit like, um, I don't know. It's it's like trying to digest Snyderverse. You you get a few good things and then the rest of it is like, what just happened? Like I have whiplash or I didn't get that. There's too many holes. So to me, that's that's the difference between when you set out to write a work with with, if you will, uh, you, you know, something to convey, you know, like a novel or a graphic novel or a movie than just creating original characters or in the day ocs like oh my gosh ocs uh, oh shudder at the memory (laughs) (laughs) yeah i totally agree i think that's what i've come to the conclusion too and unfortunately for myself i never liked the idea of an oc but then i got sucked into it because you know the whole deviant art culture and also i was feeling very depressed at the time so i didn't want to think about real life or myself or my own failures so i just start started obsessing over the idea of creating a character or story well originally it was a story but then it became a character and then you know I was thinking oh you know if I get a lot of people to like the character slash story I'm gonna somehow feel better about myself and not think about how the other parts of my life suck so I think a lot of the problem for original characters versus actually writing a story is that a lot of people who get sucked into the culture of original characters because I do think it is a culture it is kind of like you know people who 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 vlog or something it's definitely a subculture for people with specific interests and maybe even personality traits um yeah people who like original characters a lot of the time are not satisfied with their real lives so they're not like people who submit to literary zines like those people Yeah, some of them are not happy with their lives, but they have a different approach to writing. They think about the process. They think about submitting to zines and getting their stuff out there. But people who make original characters, a lot of the time, they don't even write or draw. A lot of them, they might draw, but they, you know, there might be like 35, but they draw like, you know, a 12 year old and they never (laughs) improve. And they're still, I mean, I mean, not to crap on anybody, but uh, they're still using MS Paint and it's like, you know, I just remember the cringe days of deviant art. I mean, don't get me wrong. There were some good artists out there. There were some brilliant stuff, but most of the time it was a very cringe uh, subculture. And it wasn't really about, you know, connecting with an audience or, or having an end goal, you know, like, I guess for me, what I think about now is what I'm going to convey to the audience and how I'm going to touch the audience, not, not so much for a conceit grab, but because I, I feel that stories have the power to open our minds and, and help us through difficult times or anything like that. So I do want an end goal, um, to that when I, whenever I, uh, go out to create something now, but if you're just doing the OC thing, it's just mostly for your own satisfaction, just to escape into it. You know, you're just escaping, uh, being a half angel, half demon girl, but I don't know, has a laser gun or something, or, uh, I don't know, elven Lord, uh, with a great sword or something. And it has a kingdom that has like, I don't know, crystal dragons or something. <laughs> yeah. And there's too many details. Like if someone on deviant art asks you about the character, they're like, well, and then they give you like 10 paragraphs, <laughs> right? There's, there's 10 yeah. paragraphs. And it's like, and it's like, you know, wow, I, I learned a lot about this but I didn't gain anything from it's like you know I I kind of realized this when I was doing a character of mine of uh, uh the fantasy version of Kai who is a different entirely different human being or animal if you will than the 19th century version of Kai who's now being uh d- turned into something else but I realized there were so many details about this character's life 
but it, it didn't really add anything like, yeah, it's sad, but did we learn anything from it? And I realized, oh no, this is OC. And I just thought, <sighs> I, and then I realized I was in the trap and it was just yeah, cool designs. It definitely. Cool designs. Yeah. Cause that's one of the reasons why I never liked, um, white haired Kai because I felt <laughs> like he was too cluttered like I was wondering okay I get that he had a tragic past but how does that impact him now it just felt like you know noise in the background I'm like why do we have to read all of that to understand where he comes from can't it just be summarized in one sentence exactly it would have just been better if he'd just been an ordinary Joe and like he's doing the death thing but he's been doing the death thing for so long that he has experience and sympathy. Like, did he have to have this crazy, tragic story of being a slave and then being a free man and then raiders killing his family? And, and then, you know, I don't know, he becomes bitter and he becomes a mercenary ranger dude and then he meets death and then he takes death's mantle. And that was just so long and convoluted. Like, I mean, that, that just, I mean, even someone like Tolkien was uh, more uh, simplified. Like, hmm, he'd probably say, you want to cut back on the sauce there, girl. <laughs> yeah, definitely. What do you think prompts people to make such complicated stories for their characters? I think the thing that prompts them to do it is that they're delving so much into the character that maybe this person, the writer or creator, is is going through they're trying to process maybe their own sadness maybe their own trauma so they're reliving their memories or sadness or emotions through the character and and they're using the character a bit like a persona a, a bit like the way a person makes a character in D, &D games mm -hmm. um and they're just adding all these details because in many ways they're trying to mirror an autobiography of themselves you know like for example i've had loss of family and things which i won't delve into but i tried to kind of process that pain through all the loss that kai had because you know kai was his parents and his brother and his sister and um you know he's he's dealing with a very grim bleak world he's lost friends he's seen things torn apart and um now, my experiences were not as extreme as that, but there were similar um, grave milestones in my life. And I, I tried to process it through it that way. Um, but the problem was it was noise because I wasn't really writing about it. I wasn't really delving into it. I'm just saying, oh, here's a sad man and he's he's death and he understands death because he goes through so much tragedy. But honestly, a man undergoing tragedy would not really understand death. Yes, maybe he understands loss, but the whole conceit of death being a figure is not the whole thing of, of death, but the way I had it built was starting something after life, after life on the mortal realm, you know, shuffling off the mortal coil. So it was all noise. And I guess to bring back to the original point, why people feel compelled to add so much details to their OCs, I think it's because they want to get lost in the details. And they think on this character so vividly, they live through this character so vividly, that it becomes this fixation. And this is why they pile on the details, but the audience can't wrap their head around it. Yes, we want a fleshed out character, but there's a difference between fleshed out character versus an overly detailed characterization. Maybe we should think about character versus characterization. Very true. You know, this leads us to the second question, which is what is the fine line between writing a character centric story and becoming obsessed with characters to the point you're using them as emotional crutches? This is a really, really good story. This is a good question, I should say. Um, I had experienced this with all of my characters, but really with one of them was uh, was Andre. I was mm -hmm. using Andre as an emotional crutch. In fact, I had an Andre addiction. <laughs> I had Andre withdrawal. Um, so the problem with that, so a character centric story to quote, um, you know, you know, F uh, Fitzgerald F. Scott, um, you know, character is story. And that's true. I mean, every story begins with a character. A lot of successful stories are character centric. Um, 
But what happens when you're obsessed with characters to the point that you're using them as emotional crutches, it shows in your work. Um, it can also show in your private life. Um, you know, for example, I struggled with continuing to write Andre past the romance and I couldn't, I was writing just like bare minimum, just, just, just sticks and stones, just matches. I was throwing matches, you know, right at the audience, uh, unlit matches. I should say I was throwing sticks. Um, and that was because I was only using Andre for the emotional high of romance and nothing else. And I was kind of living vicariously, maybe not so much through Andre, but through the receiving party of Tamara. And, um, I was using him essentially as a crutch, you know, my life felt crappy, um, you know, certain jobs such as retail will do that to you. So I just thought, hmm, big, strong man, you know, Andre, you know, come home, think about him, you know, he's just so masculine and warm, yet tender hearted and gentle, you know, uh, but th there's flaws too. He has flavor and texture, you know, like, oh, you know, and I would just uh, use that as an emotional crutch and that's what happens. And then the same thing can do with like, I did with Gerd and Kai a little bit. It wasn't really the romance or anything, but just getting lost in the, sometimes the cuteness of the world, you know, like, oh, cute cottage core living or, you know, fantastic creatures, you know, and, and then you, you kind of lose yourself a bit like, a bit like the, um, the soothing dream aspect world, you know, like the aspect of, of the dream world, uh, like you would see like in the Sandman, because mm -hmm. everybody wants to be comforted by dreams, but there has to be a balance of nightmares. And if there's no one to balance the dreaming, I mean, we sort of see a hypothesis of, of, of what happens. Like, uh, I mean, in, in that world, of course, there's, there's really dire consequences as we see in Neil Gaiman's Sandman, but at the same time, we look at our own lives and then, and we become, we become um, sick and, and paralyzed by our own, our own dreaming in a way. Definitely. And I think when this happens, it means that there's a lot of problems in real life that need to be addressed because for myself, when I started becoming more active in real life and realizing I just can't, you know, be bound by my depression. So for, for more time, cause I already spent so many years being bound by it you know, I stopped being obsessed with characters, just like, you know, that realization we had at the zoo, because there's no point. There's so many things around us in the real world that we need to work on. And if we continue to not work on them, we're just going to get more and more depressed and more and more mired in our obsessions. Exactly, exactly. We become, we become, we succumb to, if you will, you know, I, I guess like an allegory or an analogy of, of the sleeping sickness you know, as Gaiman showed, I mean, not that we are paralyzed in bed or anything, but like we become paralyzed in our own thoughts, our own ambitions, even the uh, faith and ability in our own confidence, because we're like, oh, my life is so crappy. I'm going to retreat and escape in this dream world. And, you know, while it is good sometimes to have a coping me mechanism to help you get through the day, when it becomes your emotional crutch and it stops you from improving your life and enjoying what's in front of you. Um, like for example, if we were to just go on and on about our characters, we wouldn't have realized all the things that were happening at the zoo, like some of the sad stuff, some of the bleak stuff, but also we would not have gotten to know each other more because then we would have just been like talking online. Like, I don't know, like on a chat room on DeviantArt, like it's 2000, it's 2016 again, you know? Yeah, role playing as Andre and Joel. <laughs> Remember, we said that Joel. we wanted to role play as them, and people are going to be like, "Who's Joel? Is he a real person?" And we thought it was a funny thing, and how it was like, "Oh, it's so good because he just he's so realistic." But then when you think <laughs> about it now, it just shows that we're, we were way too obsessed. <laughs> we were way too obsessed, and I'm glad we did not role play because um, I mean, I think Joel's more more normal, but. If people heard me pulling on a, you know, deep bass voice and I'm like, ah, uh, Davushka, you know, like Andre, <laughs> like Andre with his deep bass voice. And people look at me like, what, why is she talking like that? And I talk about the, you know, oh, the pretty Davushki, oh, Joel, Olenka, I show you how to, you know, the Get ways the of the heart. Get the woman, <laughs> the ways of the heart for a young man. And then I slap you it's on the too back. weird. <laughs> yeah definitely yeah I, I and the thing is it's it gets really annoying after a while too 
because you realize after a while that it's just the same scenes you're repeating in your head for comfort. It's not even exploring the rest of the character. Like it's one aspect of them. For example, for for Joel and Andre, it was the the sexual and the romantic stuff. And I think for fantasy Gerda and Kai, it was mostly the world because it, it kind of reminds me of you know that Luma app that you sometimes get an advertisement for. Ooh. Yes, you know, that thing about the, the, the dream the world that soothing, makes you want to fall soothing. asleep and more relaxed and, and how cute stories. it is yeah. yeah like soothing stories and that's what it was because i i kept thinking of all these you know cute scenes i was going to draw like a cozy library like with the owl people you know the sovi or you know something with you know tam sibi like i don't know like a, a cute gothic festival of lanterns or something or I even had something where there was a winter festival and, and the fish glowed under the ice and it just made it look so magical and enchanting. And I just kept thinking, or the kids buying a dragon at a fair and it gets too big and it breaks the house and it's a really cute, funny adventure. And I just kept thinking of all that soothing, soothing fantasy dreamscape, which it has a place, but if you, if it just stagnates you in a dream, then you have to let go of it because the characters need to be dynamic because you're not doing justice to the characters or to your audience to give them a story that they can work with or identify with. Exactly. And no one can give you feedback. And, you know, you would be frustrated that no one's commenting. But then how can people comment if, you know, most of the story and the whole purpose of it is just to comfort you? And also there is no there's no really structure to it. It's just a co collection of nice scenes exactly if it's a collection of nice scenes then the audience is not going to derive any satisfaction i mean maybe it might be good for like for the luna app so yeah i don't know luna app contact me co commission me <laughs> yeah it's only good for oc training right because it prompts you to make art for all the scenarios you have in your head but then oc training also doesn't really encourage you to write the story Unfortunately, OC training does not encourage writing. This was something that I didn't like from the beginning. I know it was visually based because of linguistic barriers, you know, time. It's easier to look at a visual than it is to read something. Um, but I didn't like the way the scenarios were set up. You know, a lot of them were just visual based. A lot of them are design your OC, show your OC's profile, which is fine. I, I agree with having like a model to base your character on um, because that way, especially if you're illustrating that character, you have something like an animator. Animators often use models like a character profile, but with OC training, it never goes beyond that. And it's just saying, here's this scenario. What would your character do if such and such happened or name their greatest fear? And while these are good prompts, they're not really good for the development of a character. It's just like the like the tin on the label says of the cookies, it is OC. And the grim days of deviant art was that uh, there were hundreds and hundreds of uh, clubs that had OCs, including OCs are my treasure, <laughs> <laughs> and also OC holic. OC holic. Yes, I actually belong. I was a long uh, lifetime proud member since two thousand nine. Well, two thousand twelve. I want to say. Um, so for nine years, I was with OC Holic. Oh, like, OC, 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 you know. <laughs> oh my God. You know, the, <laughs> the thing about OC, like where the term comes from, it's not even from writing. It's fanfic. Well, I mean, it is a form of writing, but it's not like writing for novels or writing for a literary magazine. It's, it's for fan fiction. So, like, when people would say OC to distinguish a character they completely made up from a character from a franchise. So, for example, Naruto XOC means that he's paired with a character that the fan fiction writer totally made up. And often that OC is a self-insert, you know. <laughs> exactly, yeah. So it, it shows us what, what OCs are actually about. It's just a form of self-indulgence. It's not about, you know, submitting to a literary magazine or getting published or anything like that. It, it's not, really. And what frustrates me is, too, you can start off with a good idea and you can start off with a good foundation. Like, 
for example, uh, everything about Andre is pretty solid. It was just a fixation on, you know, his uh, sexual prowess that uh, was my ultimate fall from grace. I felt like Lucifer from the heavens. But um, but then also to Gerda, Gerda is such a good character all the way around her concepts of wanting to, you know, have have bravery and, and leave things behind and, mm-hmm. and discover her own self. All those were good. It's just, you know, once once we got into the whole cute dream world and then, you know, magical Frost Lord with cool ass designs and powers is she just got lost. In, she stopped doing anything. Or she just sit yeah. back and relax and she's just eating cookies, you know, at this point. Exactly. <laughs> and there was no really point to it. I mean, I, I, after she left the village, I was just like, what's going on here? And it, it just became a parade of, you know, different aesthetics, really. It was a parade of aesthetics and it, it just became, you know, there was no plot. I mean, I did have a plot and an end goal. Not really an angle, just a plot. And it wasn't satisfying. It didn't make sense. It wasn't even about her. It was about, you know, the the Frost Lord. So it's like as soon as the Frost Lord showed up, um, she got swallowed into the whole uh, tidal wave of the Frost Lord and the aesthetics and the forest. And But now that I come back with her, I she she doesn't get swallowed. She controls the whole narrative. That's a lot better. And it makes it a lot easier to read, too, because previously, you know, we're seeing things from her perspective and suddenly we're thrown into a story where she's she's just a cameo. And suddenly we're supposed to, you know, think about the Frost Lord. But if you don't like him to begin with, you're no longer <laughs> invested. <laughs> That's true. You you are not. And I know that you did not have much lo- love for the Frost Lord. And I can't even say that 19th century Kai is the same person because they don't even look alike. They're not the same people. They're two entirely different dudes. I agree. And 19th century was a lot better. But the problem was that there was no coherent narrative i mean it was just kind of a concept and that was it and then it kept on changing and when something keeps on changing that means there's a problem (laughs) there is a big problem so if you if you see something's changing our fellow writers and artists out there please reevaluate what you're doing because that means there's doubt you don't know what's going on with it and it reminds me of a very messy messy animation development like when you watch those behind the scene documentaries of a disney animated film and you realize wow this movie could have been so different but if you realize there's too many things to change please step back and reevaluate your work definitely and i think you should pause instead of hey you know if i make one final change i think this is going to fall into place because that's usually not the case if you make a change you're going to make ten thousand more changes and then you're going to start questioning everything and then you're going to end up deleting the character or i don't know doing something that you really regret or murdering them on the sims exactly so if you have doubt i think you should just not touch it for a while yeah sometimes you need a respite from it i mean i've been doing that um i took a long respite from gerda i didn't think she could it wasn't so much that she couldn't be saved, but I had to really think about her herself and not about her world, not about the cuteness or coolness, but who she was as as a woman. Um, and right now I'm taking a hiatus uh, a little bit from Andre. Um, I'll come back to him soon, but I needed a break from all the sexiness. Andre was... Andre was becoming my personal Fabio, unfortunately. <laughs> yes, unfortunately. And also another thing about um, Gerda previously was that you weren't really that focused on her other than the fact that she felt bad about herself. And then after she leaves, the focus becomes on the male character in the story all the time, whether it's the 19th century or the fantasy version. So then the focus always ends up on the man that's true and it's always alarming when a man comes on the horizon i i can see why you're worried about the entrance of uh the male character in in gerda's uh new self if you will i, I know you're worried about vogler but <laughs> he will not be a threat i promise <laughs> i understand yeah I, I think it's because i'm like what if he's a mix of andre and kai Oh no, 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 no. Shit, Vogler right? is that, that, how addictive that would be. <laughs> Ew, no, 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 no. He's not fantasy Kai. He's not Andre. Vogler's an entirely different dude. Like, like I, I cannot sexualize Vogler at all in my mind, but neither can I think about his coolness. So 
um you know vogler is just a good supportive friend that you know he and he and gerda become very close and they uh i won't give spoilers but they they go through many different things and it's mostly about gerda's own journey but you know he, i think he also helps her mature a lot because there's a lot of aspects of gerda that is very immature but also in turn what gerda does for him is that i i think she helps him i think i think overcome a lot of things like accepting something that he has but also uh, allowing himself to you know form friendships and and get attached to people and i, I it, it's there's a nice re re reciprocal nature to their to their uh friendship so to speak yes definitely so um on to our last question how can you avoid unhealthily being obsessed with characters oh gosh well for one thing please close your deviant art tab and you know unjoin oceaholic <laughs> but in all serious in all seriousness though um i think you need to let it you reevaluate what your character means to you if you're using your character as a sexual comfort character if they are a comfort character in general step back and then also realize that they have a story to tell you can't fixate on scenarios you can't fixate on how cool or badass or sexy they are you have to realize they have a story to tell they have a life to live and it's your obligation as an author as the creator as the auteur as they say to deliver a story that makes sense to the audience you have you have the obligation to deliver a message to the audience and and you are you are that life for you are the pen of which that care that character is going to narrate through so realize that do not get fixated on the what ifs or the scenarios um and and just focus on you know getting the character through the journey because they'll never be able to finish that journey if you just have them at level one i mean if you have them never leave the shire if you will or if you just have them you know just permanently stuck in the idels of rivendell so to speak uh Isn't you know all stuck our... in the bedroom I was trying. Yes, <laughs> you're either stuck in the bedroom. You're either stuck in the bedroom with Fabio with the silk satin cushions, or you know you're underneath a star starlit sky in a I don't know a, a wagon caravan or a canyon or something, and um, or like I said, you're stuck in the idols of Rivendell or a, a bedroom in Rivendell. I mean, Elrond's thinking, what's going on here? I heard some weird noises coming out of that door. Arwen, what are you doing? Arwen, you know, and then you see a, a really tall man at seven feet tall with long flowing hair and open and shirt come out <laughs> and abs. Like suddenly, suddenly Aragorn is shredded. You know, like all that crazy fan art I've seen, like which I don't approve because Aragorn is a grimy ranger. He is not a uh, he is not a Fabio. I, I do seven not stand feet, for this. He's seven feet tall. He's <laughs> not supposed to be. He's supposed to be short. Like he comes from a race of men that are like short and dark or something like i don't know original celts or something <laughs> um, but um poor aragorn um but yeah El Elrond's banging on the door arwen what are you doing and he's hearing all these weird noises coming out of arwen's bedroom <laughs> <laughs> yeah definitely <laughs> but yes you can avoid that by realizing this character has work to do we've got pardon my French, we've got shit to do, sister. We've got shit to do, brother. And then that's how you let go of the obsession. Mm -hmm. And me, also anyway. reevaluating what role creativity plays in your life. Like, you know, if someone is just extremely fixated on creativity and they think that they can use creativity to change their life and, you know, elevate them from not having really much of a career to world famous author that's probably unrealistic thinking that is very unrealistic thinking that was something i struggled with because i thought hmm my meal ticket out of here was either going to be andre or or gerda but then i realized that made me want to just stuff tropes in because i'm like oh the audience wants this all right cool world stuff that in Hmm, badass with sword, long flowing hair. I checked all the marks. 
Kai is like every other character. He's like, I don't know, Sephiroth, Shishamaru. He's like uh, Geralt of Rivia. You know, he's like El- Elric of Melbanone. He's like all those characters. I'm like, hmm, okay, popular. Or Andre, I'm like, hmm, hot bedroom, hot man. Hmm, okay, all the check marks are here. Now, I'm just going to write this and wait for my contract and then wait for the big cinema adaptation or Netflix giving me a $2 million deal. <laughs> yeah and the thing is if you only think about that it also becomes more and more unrealistic because a lot of the times people who think like this they are not necessarily writing the novel or you know pitching it to publishers or building a relationship with editors and publishers you know so I think a lot of the times it's super unrealistic when you're not even thinking about how to get your work out there that's true. It's not. That was the problem. I guess for Andre, I was writing, but I was just writing the same scene over and over again. And with Gerda and Kai, I mean, Gerda herself, I didn't even write. I didn't even write anything solid. I didn't write anything about her village. I didn't write anything about her life. I was just focused on the beautiful visuals of the, the Frost Lord and his hair. Like, I just, I had like a whole paragraph describing his hair, like, I don't know, frost spun gossamer or something. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. So you really have to think about the purpose of your creativity. Are you just using it as a narcotic to to think that you are, oh, you know, I'm very special. I just have to wait until, you know, this contract drops out of the sky and then I can finally leave my shit life behind. Or, you know, if you're not balancing your creativity with other aspects of your life, it's probably not going to work because you do need to work on other aspects of your life before you have the confidence to start pitching your work to people. And then maybe you could be someone famous and I always say somewhat because there's no guarantees even if you write a wonderful book because not a lot of people are reading anymore unfortunately it's very hard to get you know a lot of money so even if you do get published maybe you only will earn $500 a year so you know you have to get you have to be be prepared for that not don't think oh just because you know once I'm finished my novel I'm going to become the next JK Rowling Exactly. That is a fallacy a lot of people need to avoid. And, you know, you set yourself up for unhappiness when you do that. And then you you almost start to hate creating. You start to hate your work. You start to hate your characters. And, you know, if you want to have a good relationship with your characters and and your relationship with creativity, don't do that. Um, Look at it as something I've learned. There doesn't have to be a point sometimes. Just think of it as a way to show your storytelling or art skills or both but also just think of it as a way to connect with people and have fun just just think Mm -hmm. of it as something that brings you joy brings you fun exactly don't think of it as your whole life don't live vicariously through the characters and build the other aspects of your life too because who knows i mean don't think about it all the time but there is you know, there is a possibility that if you get to know more people and build your career, you're going to have the chance to get your work out there. No, you're, you're probably not going to become the next JK Rowling, but maybe you're going to get your book printed at a small shop and maybe four people are going to like it in your city. And maybe that's better than absolutely no one and just, you know, an endless echo chamber of OC fanatics on DeviantArt. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And you know, you never know. You, there's a lot of, there, a lot of people are consuming indie stuff. You might be, you might become a name in indie circles as much as I was uh, hitting on uh, indies uh, in my, in my own podcast. I, I really want to say that it, some, sometimes it's, it's good to be indie, like an indie band, you know? True. Well, thank you so much for coming onto the podcast and you know sharing these wonderful tips, because I think a lot of people need to know the difference between creating an original character versus writing a story. I'm very, thank you so much for having me on here. I was happy to join you again. And thank you for letting me talk with you. See you. Thank you so much. See you. Bye.